Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening. My name is Sheila Gaskins, and welcome to Legacy of the Craft. I will be your moderator, and we are so glad that you're here. Um, I want to start things off um, by acknowledging the land that we stand on. Um, the, we honor the indigenous people and their traditions and their ancestral sacrifices uh, for us to be here. Um, this is the Scattaway, the Lumbee, the Lumbee and the Cherokee tribes up and down the East Coast up here at the DMV area. Um, and the beauty of them is that the women were agriculturists and they did plants, uh, they made municipal tobacco, and the men were hunters and fishermen, um, and they believe in indigenous rights and human rights. So there is a reason for Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman and Benjamin Banneker and Thurgood Marshall to come from this area. And I'm just excited to be here, uh, welcome. Um, we're going to have the, the cast, uh, the panelists uh, introduce themselves. Um, and we're going to take it from there. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi. Hi. Welcome, everybody. welcome, welcome. So please introduce yourselves. Jump right on in. Hi, I'm Brenda Hayes. I directed and produced the documentary Backburner Dreams, and it's an honor to be here. Hi, my name is Keisha Williams, and I directed Mothering in Quarantine. Hi, my name is Cynthia Khabib, and I produced Kindred Spirits, artists Hilda Wilkinson-Brown and Lillian thomas Burwell. Hi, my name is Carla Poindexter, and I am one of the cast members of Brenda Hayes' film Backburner Dreams. It's a pleasure to be here. Hi, I'm Trish Adora, and I'm the star of Southside Suplex. Hi, I'm Antonio Hernandez, and I'm the director, producer, uh, videographer, and editor of Southside Suplex, starring Trish Adora. Awesome. So we're all here accounted for. Uh, so my first question is uh, the inspiration behind each story. Where did it come from? And uh, we're just so glad that you all made these stories. So just go for it. Well, for Backburner Dreams, in the beginning of the film, I say this is the story of three women. And it's my story, too. I uh, started my career, if I can use that term loosely, in film at 59. I'm 65 now. And for most of my life, I did not live my passion. I had mm. to um, toe the line that society, you know, laid out for, for all of us. And it was a, not a good existence. I eventually became a, a divorced mom. So I had to work to make sure my, my child had a roof over their head, was uh, educated in the way that I felt that the, the need was there for that education. And all the while I had this passion and dream that went unfulfilled. And um, that was the inspiration behind the film. Awesome. Come on, anybody, step on up, you guys. Feel free. Well, as one of the uh, women from Backburner Dreams, I my uh, background is a little bit different from Brenda's. I actually started my life pursuing my dreams. Um, but at, from a very young age, I struggled with very severe depression and um, also just along the way, how easy it is, especially for a black woman in America, for your dreams to kind of be, um, I don't want to say taken away from you, but from, from being discouraged. And so through the process of uh, being a participant on the film and the filmmaking process, it really kind of put me in a different place and shifted me where... I actually began to create a life for myself and my family where who we were as people 
um, were the driving force to how we would set up our lives. And because of my participation in the film, it, it shifted me in a, in a tremendous way, more than I could ever um, express in a very short period of time. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. For me, uh, mothering in quarantine came from really just a need to articulate um, and heal from uh, what was going on um, once we started lockdown uh, back in March. And I knew that I was going through things. I knew that uh, friends of mine and loved ones of mine were going through things. Uh, and it felt like we were going through them in silos, but they're really similar things. And by coming together, uh, we're really able to talk about some of the similar things that were happening to us uh, and with us and the things that we were emotionally going through uh, at that time. And uh, that's where the film came from. Nice. Um, I guess I'll, I'll talk next. Um, the inspiration for my film, Kindred Spirits, came when I attended a historical studies conference in Washington, DC. I was presenting two other uh, of my films there. And uh, during the conference, I came across a brochure and on the brochure was this very striking modernist painting. And uh, I was really struck by it. And I looked to see who the artist was and it said, Hilda Wilkinson Brown. I had never heard of her before. So I started doing some research and my research led me to her niece, Lillian Thomas Burwell. When I got in touch with her niece, it turns out that her niece Lillian had also become a very accomplished artist herself and that she and her aunt Hilda had developed a very unique bond as aunt and niece mm -hmm. and her aunt had a really transformative effect on her career as an artist and as a teacher and so that was really the spark for the documentary. Nice. And um, yeah, with Southside Suplex, uh, I grew up a big uh, pro wrestling fan. Um, I kind of fell out when I went to school, when I was in college, I was kind of just worried about getting through school and everything. Um, a few years ago, I ended up getting back into it. Um, and then I kind of learned a lot about what went into the sport, into the art of pro wrestling. Um, ended up meeting Trish um, just by chance. I went to a coffee shop in DC uh, on February 15th and I saw there was a flyer for a show that featured um, all or almost all black wrestlers. And um, I knew, I saw that was happening that night and I was like, I need to find where the show is. It was happening in DC. So I went on the internet on Instagram looking for some other details about it. I like manically uh, found Trish's Instagram was messaging her about it. Like, hey, I, I want some more information. I ended up uh, getting some photos that I used for the film um after the show was over i was just amazed at uh, trisha's performance and after the show there was literally 10 minutes before everyone had to leave the building and i said hey i think um i want to make a film about you and your work and we met for coffee about a week later um we started filming i think a week after that and then soon after that that pandemic hit mm -hmm. shut everything down so i was able to cobble everything I had gotten. I had wanted to make like a something a little bit longer than it was, uh, close to a full feature, um, but I decided to take um, the interviews and the footage, um, the promotions she worked for before also um, allowed me to use some of those old, older matches that she's had in, um, across the country. Um, so I was able to put everything I had into a short because I think people would really be interested in her story um, and kind of her process. Yes, and I am appreciative that we met Antonio. Um, it was a chance encounter and afterwards there was so much going on. And when he came up to me, I was kind of like, oh, okay, he wants to, you know, do like a, a film or documentary. I didn't quite understand uh, what that meant, but I was intrigued. So I decided to link up and um, just this whole ride since has just been very eye-opening for me, just even being a part of something like this you know, be a part of film festivals and things like that. Like it's opening my eyes to the world in ways that I've never seen. So I'm thankful for that. And I'm really honored that my story is getting put out there. 
Awesome. So Trish, you got the belt. Can we see? Can yes. we see the belt? <laughs> it's beautiful. So it's so happy. Me. Look at that. That is oh, amazing. Wow. Wow. Yes. The wow. African World Diaspora Championship. I know that's Congratulations. right. Congratulations. Yes. yes. Defended yes. against men and women. All um, right now. Awesome. Awesome. So can you tell me how you prepare your body to take such a beat down or beat up or <laughs> whatever the expression is? What do you, what, what does one have to do for that? Um, so it is pretty physically demanding, uh, pretty taxing on the body overall. So it's important to keep up with training. Um, there's pro wrestling schools across, across the country, across the world. Um, I'm attending one right now, Ring of Honor. And so working closely with them is allowing me to keep my training up. Um, right now, since the pandemic is going on, there's about one match a month, you know, because we're trying to be safe and just inching back into normalcy. Um, but it would, it used to be like two matches a weekend, you know? So just trying to keep my body in shape still, you know, and keep that same level of intensity, it would equal maybe four days a week training out of seven usually, so. Wow. Is there, is there a diet regimen or what about um, eating? Yes, that's actually, honestly, that's really the most important part of everything mm. that I'm doing, you know? Um, I'm never going to outrun my bad diet, you know? So it's just better to make that lifestyle change. So eating more whole foods and, and not as many processed foods, things like that, keeping your calorie intake in count, you know, prioritizing your sleep, drinking water, you know, um, things like that, taking a walk every day, just even meditation, lots of things just contribute to your overall, so. Great, great. Um, so this question is for Backburner Dreams. Um, ladies, how, um, I, know, I know when I was, growing up, my mom would always say that I was selfish if I did anything that didn't involve family or children first. And can y'all tell, tell me about the process of, of, of that kind of complex idea of women having to take care of everyone mm. and then put themselves on the back burner? Yeah, that's, that's a good question, Sheila. Um, my models were my mom and my maternal grandmother. And like many black families, they migrated from the deep South of Louisiana, the deep uh, Jim Crow South of Louisiana and the uh, mid fifties to the DC area. And uh, they were the original black girl magic because what they did was defy uh, Jim Crow, racism, the whole nine, poverty, and made a life for me and my brothers. Um, they modeled resilience for me and never giving up. Uh, their mantra was get a good government job, however. Mm -hmm. And that was something I, I knew I would never do. And that wasn't in my makeup, my, my genes at all. <laughs> Um, but I thank them for modeling that strength in the face of and that resilience. And they did put us first. And what I regret, Sheila, is that I never knew what their dreams were. Mm. I knew they were bright, uh, witty, quick, uh, could make, uh, you know, uh, fur out of a piece of yarn, you know, <laughs> but to know what their heart held and the, mm. their soul and their dreams was, was, was really hard, you know, and they're, they've gone now. And, um, wow. Yeah. So I wish they would put, would have put themselves first, at least some of the time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, um, I think it's an interesting, uh, complex issue that we have now in this time and age. Um, likewise, with my mother and my grandmother, um, I had two grandmothers. I had my um, brown skin, four foot eight um, grandmother, and then I had my, uh, on my father's side, my grandmother who was able to pass quietly. She just would go and she would just get jobs. She wouldn't say, 
um, what she, in fact, her race actually up until we were adults never really came up. But what I learned from both of them, um, I knew my, my brown skin grandmother very well. She ended up being one of the first RNs in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And she, she cleaned toilets to put herself through nursing school. And it was all done to elevate her children mm. and, then, and, and therefore to elevate us. And sometimes I think that, you know, we're privileged to be able to think of ourselves in terms of and be able to pass on to our children, who are you and what is it that you want to be and who do you want to become? Because for the generations that passed, the dream was survival. Right. And the dream was to be able to build something that was not under the thumb of, you know, the oppressor. So maybe they didn't have the privilege that we have to think of themselves in terms of, well, I'll train to be a dancer or I want to be a lawyer. I want, and, and then even in the midst of that, we had many who did do that, right? right. Um, but as far as putting yourself first, my honest belief is if you do not put yourself first in terms of being able to cultivate a sense of who you are and being able to be in touch uh, in touch with what's in you, and including your health and wellness and your, your spirituality, then there's not a lot left to pass on to um, those who come after us. <clears throat> you know, and Sheila, you mentioned the word legacy backstage. And when we think about how we've been conditioned to believe that putting yourself first is selfishness right um we're kind of doing a dis disservice to our legacies by telling them that you don't really matter as much as the next person whoever that next person will be mm -hmm. but you can't really be um a whole person in your relationships with your children your spouses your <clears throat> family if you're not if you don't have a whole relationship with yourself right right so Kindred spirits, help me pronounce your name. Cynthia. Cynthia. Um, so tell me about that because that is such a a wonderful part of history. Um, I never knew, and I'm familiar with the Crisis Magazine, um, and it's just it's just good to know that somebody was doing art back then. You know, um, so tell me a little bit more about that. Well, the person that you're, you're talking about is Hilda Wilkinson Brown. She um, was an African-American woman who was born in the late 1800s. Mm -hmm. She grew up in a segregated society, uh, attended Washington, D.C. segregated public schools. And um, before she became a teacher, uh, well, she was an artist all her life, but she spent 38 years teaching at Minor Teachers College, which then after Brown versus Board of Education became integrated and became DC Teachers College. She was an illustrator for The Crisis, which was and still is the official magazine of the NAACP founded by W.E.B. Du Bois. Mm -hmm. And then she became an illustrator for The Brownies Book, which was the first magazine for African-American children, also founded by W.E.B. Du Bois. And what those two magazines offered was not only uh, information and, and uh, poems and stories and illustrations by African-Americans, but it gave African-American writers and artists and others, civic activists, civil rights activists, a platform where they could produce, write, illustrate. That was very, very important. So what you'll see during uh, wh when this country uh, you know, was a segregated society, uh, African-Americans went to different schools, they weren't allowed to go to uh, eating establishments, et cetera. African-Americans created their own venues to produce and publish their work. 
Uh, and so uh, you see that throughout uh, my documentary, uh, establishing an art gallery, for example, the Barnett Aiden Gallery in Washington, DC, when again, African-American artists were rejected by other museums. They weren't able to exhibit their work. So two African-Americans, one who was a professor at Howard University, the other um, who was a curator at the Howard University Gallery of Art, uh, got together and they established an art gallery where they were able to then provide a space where African-Americans could exhibit their work. So that's something that runs all through the film. Yeah, and, and, uh, and a lot of these films are, are happy endings. They, they are, they're positive films with, with great endings. Um, quarantine, uh, Keisha, tell me a little bit about uh, that whole process because I have become so creative doing this COVID thing. I, I, I have poetry going on. I have puppets. Um, I lost weight. I wow. lost weight. I said I lost weight. Weight is what I lost. Um, and I, I think it's really one of my dreams. Like people talk about dreams, but I always, ever since elementary school, true story, I wanted to be married and not have to work. And since COVID, I literally was making unemployment and coming downstairs and creating and not having to worry about things. So, so tell me a little bit about that, Keish. Sure. <laughs> you can call me Keish. Um, I, hmm, so many things to say about this one. But yeah, I definitely have been much more creative um, during quarantine, which has been a lovely surprise. Uh, I wasn't expecting that to happen, but when I was able to really, you know, get the time that I've always wanted to rest uh, a little bit, obviously, because I have a toddler, uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, I really had a little bit more space to think and be, uh, and that, had me be much more creative and had me, um, I think, be able to share from a really deep and vulnerable place. So uh, that's what Mothering in Quarantine is grounded in. Um, you know, when I had done the interviews and cut things together, I was like, did I really just make a doc on Zoom? <laughs> like, I never, ever would have thought that um, something like that was possible and that I would be able to have the tools within myself to make that happen. Um, and, you know, even a couple uh, months later, I have many more skills that, um, you know, I'll be putting into episode two and three and, um, and my future work. But really this time has just been um, a time to settle in to myself and my work. Um, and also really to make visible uh, all of the ways that I work, um, all of the ways that I put in physical labor, emotional labor, uh, you know, financial, like all of the ways that moms, um, particularly uh, black moms and for myself, uh, a black femme mom, there's just so much work that we do that's not acknowledged and not appreciated. Um, and I really want us to make more space uh, for our la labor and our lives to be seen and understood. Nice. That's excellent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess this question would be for everyone. Um, I was talking about happy endings. Um, you got the belt. I mean, every, every, every movie that I saw you guys had happy endings. And that is very rare when it comes to, to black film. Mm -hmm. I call it, I call it the pressure syndrome. You, 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 you either, uh, your mom, you don't have a great relationship with your mom. Uh, somebody's on drugs. You have a terminal disease, all of that in a film. And you guys chose happy endings. Um, so can you guys tell me a little bit about that? and feel free to just jump in. This is double Dutch now, y'all, double Dutch. 
just jump on in. Yeah, well, Black with Femmes. Southside Suplex. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just yeah, say yeah. Black Femmes need more happy endings. We just need so many more of them. Yeah. And we're not a monolith, you know. We have happy endings. We have sad. We're human. So we with that comes everything, every emotion, every possibility, every probability. And we like uh, we need to see the the totality and the complexities of our lives. Absolutely. Yes. Go ahead. Rendis, Antonio. Oh, I'd like to echo that um, same thing. I want to show that, um, like like you mentioned, there's kind of like a, a focus on kind of negative and the negative outcomes and kind of feeling that if you see a black person or a black woman, black film person, you know, they, they'll face a child, they'll face a challenge and they're stuck until maybe, you know, there's a white Prince Charming, for example, that comes mm -hmm. or an organization or some kind of, some kind of white presence that will lift them out mm -hmm. and show, you know, that it happens every day. People lift themselves out. You know, my, my grandmother's back was black. Uh, she passed, but uh, I saw her every day lift herself out and lift others um, in many ways. So I think um, to not do that in film is kind of doing disservice to uh, these stories. I often say as a, as a playwright and, uh, and a director that you can change the ending. The, the black person doesn't have to die the 10 minutes into the film. Like you can really <laughs> rewrite, really, you can, because you, you're writing, you're writing this. And so they don't have to die. It doesn't, yeah. Slam and Queen, Queen and Slam. Like I was like, get on the plane, Slam and Queen. Y'all <laughs> got like all of that and you couldn't get on the plane? Oh my God. No, <laughs> that's why Harriet yeah. was so awesome because we already know the ending of Harriet. Right. We already know that. So, you know, we don't have to, because what happens is you guys, we get used to it. Yeah. We get I, used to it. I also think that um, what are the wonderful things about where we are now is the fact that we're able to choose our platforms. We are, we're able to create our own fan bases. We're not we're not limited to the um, old traditional Hollywood or you know the music industry has changed. The movie industry has changed just by virtue of the internet, and so we're not subject to other people dictating what type of movies or what type of art they want to see from black people and black women. We can just go ahead and do whatever the heck we want to do and we find our people to support us. And I think that that's like a tremendous advantage that that we have now nowadays, you know? And also, you know, when I think about myself as far as my own personal happy ending, my own personal happy ending was so much more than me just um, singing and songwriting and performing again. It was really being being able to um, grab hold up to my authentic self again and kind of uncover who that person has always been, you know, and elevate her. And so my, my story, my, my happy ending is, well, for me personally, is that one, I'm still here when many people who, many people with, with, um, who suffer from the type of things that I suffered from did not make it out alive. I'm still here, but also that, um, I found myself in the process and uh, whatever that entails. Now, all of that, I can't say is quote unquote happy, but, you know, we're here and we, we have these beautiful stories to tell. We have these beautiful experiences. There's beauty in, in, in um, struggle in some, some aspects to it because it does really forge um, a character. Um, and there's also beauty in, in understanding the, the grabbing hold to the newness of who you are. Yeah. And so the happy ending is that we're, 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 we're moving forward, you know, and, and <laughs> our expression doesn't always have to be a literal expression of our struggle. We, we right. can express our beauty, we can express our, our, our families, we can express our love, and 
and that's good because right. for a while it was like we know we just kind of want to see the struggle. The struggle is important, but we want to see those, you know, this, those stories. But now we have we have we we have everything to tell and to show, just right. just like anybody else. And long overdue too. I remember seeing on Facebook somebody said, "Why does racism have to be my muse?" <laughs> But I think in us creating these stories, it's changing the paradigm right. of the larger industry because more and more people are aligning with our happy ending stories and forcing the industry to change because their bottom line is dollars. Right. And when they see that the stories we are creating are lucrative, they're going to align with those stories and uh, change the paradigm of us dying in the first 10 minutes of the film, hopefully. Yeah. yeah. We had to explain that to our kids, Brenda, when my husband and I would make the joke when we were watching, because we like horror, when we were watching the horror movies and we would make the joke. They were like, what are you talking about? <laughs> we were like, you need to go back to the 60s and 70s and 80s, watch every single horror, ma horror movie. And if there's a black dude in it, he's dead, first 10 minutes. And they were like, really? <laughs> so that shows a little progress right there that they're not, you know, locked into the same necessarily. We have to show them kind of the stereotypes of, that existed before. But um, I think we're living in a great, I mean, every era has its greatness as far as art and expression. But I do think that, um, you know, where we are now has just opened up um, expression and artistic expression for, for everybody. It's not just a, you know, um, a elite type of world now. People can express themselves in so many ways. And I think that that's, that's, that's the beauty of, of, of today. Yeah. Yeah. So Antonio, tell me something. So you said you were into wrestling? Yeah, yeah, I got into when I was young, uh, maybe like eight or nine years old, just watching it on TV. So you never wanted to wrestle? No, um, I saw just how painful it looked. I I knew that uh, <laughs> I knew that it was it wasn't quote unquote fake, but I I did know um, that there was a certain amount of pain. You know, I. You know, there was the point where wrestlers were passing away due to things like mm. drugs or steroids. Um, a wrestler, Owen Hart, actually died in the ring from a stunt, and this was mm. live on pay per view. Wow! Uh, so I, I knew that um, that there was just a certain amount of kind of danger and risk that wrestlers um, took just to perform, like every single time. And then there was a, a film called Beyond the Mat which came on 1999, which is a documentary. It kind of goes behind the scenes. And I started, as I got older, I started learning more about the actual training and what it took. And just even just getting, just taking a slam onto a mat, just how much that just rattles your body. And performers and wrestlers like Trish are doing that multiple times. Like imagine just getting slammed on your back multiple times a day, like every week like all year and you do that year after year after year. And so I I really appreciate the art, but then I reach I really appreciated the risk that people took um just to entertain people, you know. And it's yeah. the art, you know, it's very physical. So the older I got, the the more I I respected the craft of wrestling. And I was like, I I kinda look back on what I was watching at the time and I was just like, I can't believe I was just like I would just watch this and not I never really appreciated when I was younger because you know you have these big characters and people are just like just doing all kinds of things, doing all kinds of stunts. But when you break it down, and uh, and Trish could tell you she talks about it in the film, but the the amount of time and the you have to be built different. I, you have to be built or born a certain way, I think, to to be a wrestler and want to actually do it and take on that that risk. Wow. So, so Tris, I, I know I used to wrestle in, in high school and junior high school, you know, just kicking it and stuff. And mm -hmm. I think I could take you. <laughs> oh, yeah. I ain't never <laughs> I ain't never 
I know. I'd pay, I would pay to see that. I'd pay to see that. It's on. It's on. <laughs> So tell us a little bit more about, about, you know, you doing that, like really saying, I'm going to do this. Mm. Yeah. Um, so um, I guess I'll start maybe at the beginning, right? So uh, just to give a little quick run through, uh, I started uh, training about four years ago. I moved from D.C. Once I uh, got out of the Army, I packed up all my stuff literally that week. I packed up everything into a car and I drove down to Florida and I started, you know, looking around for schools. Um, I emptied out all my savings and just kind of jumped feet first, <laughs> you know. Um, there were a couple of missteps in the beginning, just trying to find the right school for me and just understand pricing. And then it was the first time as well that I was kind of by myself. It was the first time I was away from home with no safety net, you know, outside of being in the Army. So it, I, I had to, to learn very quickly and understand that to be a wrestler, you could not just physically be strong. You had to mentally be strong. You have to emotionally be strong. You know, you have to have a strong sense of self in order to not let this game, which already feels like it's not made for you being a black woman. It's very white male dominated. And it already feels like it's not exactly made for you or welcoming, you know? So if you don't have a strong sense of self, it's really gonna be a rough road to whatever you feel your happy ending is. And for me, this is my happy ending, but it feels like a new beginning too. You know, mm -hmm. it feels like I'm starting a whole new journey, you know, and it's a journey that is just sort of opened me up to a lot of things. My relationship with my mother has gotten a lot better. You know, I'm, I'm an only girl, I have five brothers and my mom was an only girl too. Mm -hmm. She has two brothers. So the pressure of, you know, being beset by, you know, this guilt of duty to your family, you know, it's just kind of something that was unfortunately felt like it was passed on to me as well. Mm -hmm. And it was just hard at 19 trying to be like, all right, I, you know, embarrassingly enough, you know, I flunked out of college, you know, I felt out of options. So I joined the army because I still needed to, you know, be successful. I didn't have the luxury to just not. You know, I can have knucklehead brothers. I got a couple, <laughs> you know, I, I can't be the knucklehead sister. Mm -hmm. It just wouldn't exactly work. So, <laughs> so I joined the army and I'm, I'm thankful that I did. I'm really happy with, you know, a lot of the lessons that I learned about myself and others, but wrestling felt like it was 100% for me, something mm -hmm. that I always wanted to do. And that's why it feels so beautiful to be able to do it and to see people say, you know, oh, I see you, you're so, you're so black, you're so proud, I love it, keep doing what you're doing, sis. You know, we're changing their minds, we're, we're, we have our own space to work now, we don't need their space now, and it's all because of you now. And it's just like, to hear that, it feels so good. And I know that this is just a new beginning instead of a happy ending, so. Nice, nice. And, and, and I love the fact that, you know how some, some have gimmicks, they got all of this, this and that, you just be coming in like, and what? <laughs> and what? <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. Um, so Kindred Spirits, uh, help me say your name again. I'm, I'm Cynthia. Cynthia. Um, Cynthia. Cynthia. I, 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 I remember seeing the end of the film when she's walking on the sand, but she's also using tools <laughs> to cut um, some of the sculpture and, and she's not that young with these tools. <laughs> that is so inspirational. Yeah. She, Lillian is uh, 93 now and um, she creates um, what she calls sculptural paintings where she carves out different shapes uh, from wood and then she covers them with canvas and she paints on the canvas and then um, she has also um, taken um, plexiglass and added to those sculptures. She has an, uh, this huge oven <laughs> in her studio and she puts the plexiglass in the oven until she can bend it into um, different shapes and add that to her, um, to her sculpture. So yeah, she was there with a jigsaw <laughs> working out in her back porch. 
Um, recently, she she hasn't been able to work um, just because you know she's 93. She's had some health issues, and she's also been working with the Smithsonian Archives of American Art, where they are. Uh, she's helping them put together all this information um, about her and her life um, to put in the archives. Hopefully, they'll include Hilda Wilkinson Brown also. Um, she uh, is. Uh, just amazing, and she um, she's selling her work for uh, for quite a lot of money nowadays. It's in demand. Um, it's a very unique abstract expressionist art that she creates. So, yeah, awesome. I, I could probably buy her um, her <laughs> stuff. I'm taking her on. I'm buying uh, that. So I'm living large. This is my dream right now. Um, so. Uh, I think I have a couple of more questions. Um, I was talking about, I was talking about a village and I'm a product of the seventies. I ain't gonna say how much, that's not important. Um, <laughs> but in the seventies, everything was so beautiful and plentiful. And uh, Hilda's story uh, in, in Kindred Spirits, it talks about an aunt who was checking for a niece and said, go ahead and let her do that. So my question to you guys as panelists, who who had your back? Um, I know when when I was um, a teenager, uh, the the whole village like had my back. Like <laughs> they they knew I could talk, and so they would put me in in the position to talk. And I remember going to a rec center, and the the lady just said, you. And I was like, me? She's like, yeah, I want you to represent our community in a speak up and speak out competition. And I'm like, 14 years old, I'm like, what? Like, how you know I could even speak? And I guess she just could tell from my loud voice. Um, and we messed around and I won, like the whole, the whole segment thing. Like, so, so who, who got your back? Who, who checking for y'all that you don't know about? Or that, that you know about? Well, uh, for the, the journey that I'm on now that I started about six years ago, really a little bit longer than that, um, I can't really call them my aunties because they're decades younger than me. <laughs> but they're my, they're my chosen family. They're my community. In that community are artists, mainly. Um, the one who kind of really set me on this path is B. Steadwell. She's a mm. filmmaker, sing, singer, songwriter. And she asked me to help her with some of her music videos in 2010, 2013. She asked me to co-produce her uh, thesis film, Vow of Silence, which has since been screened worldwide and multi uh, award winning film. So as I am decades older than the, these artists, most of whom are women, um, which is a good thing, I, I can call them my aunties, my mentors, the ones who uh, encourage me. And it's a two-way street, I, I must say, but I am blessed to have them in my life. Nice. Jump on in, y'all. This is double Dutch. <laughs> For me, I would say it was my parents and my sisters who always supported what I did and they celebrated with me. Um, they took an interest in the work that I did. Um, and, um, you know, we're just, just a very close family. And uh, that was just a, a huge support for me because as, as a filmmaker, it's, it's not an easy road and you get a lot of rejection along the way. <laughs> you know, you might apply for grants and not get them or, something, uh, you know, it's kind of a lonely road sometimes when you're creating a film um, because Definitely. it's your own it's your own idea and nobody mm -hmm. has asked you to do it. But mm -hmm. I feel that with their support and they're, you know, telling me don't, don't get down, what you're doing is important and never questioning what I was doing, but always encouraging me to do it. Um, it's just a huge thing for me. Nice. Y'all, we got about five minutes left, so who's checking for y'all? 
who's checking for you five minutes before q a yes. so yeah uh for me i think that it's important to kind of curate a whole ecosystem especially in wrestling because it tends to be very competitive because essentially people are competing for jobs and gigs and bookings and things like that even from the independent level all the way up to professional what you see on tv things like that so it's kind of competition is sort of threaded in the culture of wrestling so it's really up to each individual to kind of build their ecosystem to find those like-minded people that are you know there's so many avenues to take and you got to find people that are just ready to stomp it like you are ready to go at it like you are people that have your back because you are your circle you know if the people in your circle don't inspire you if they don't have your back and if they aren't trying to build too it's like what are they even doing you know so there's a lot of um other black wrestlers and things like that, especially in the DMV area that, you know, I always try to link up with and train with and learn from, you know, we just got to have each other's backs, honestly. Nice. Keisha, Antonio, who's checking for you? Um, uh, I, for me, it's my... Um... Okay, Keisha, then Antonio. Okay. Antonio, you have been such a perfect gentleman, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to tell your mother. She you did well. Go ahead, Keisha. <laughs> Uh, so for me, uh, Sophia Randera is a queer spiritual worker and filmmaker in Toronto that uh, supported me in 2010 when I made my first film. Um, Ella Cooper, who founded Black Woman Film Canada, um, has definitely been very helpful in connecting me to other Black femme uh, creators, talented creators. And I would say also uh, Michelle Clark, who is a photographer and filmmaker in Toronto. Uh, those are some of the folks that I can think of that really just supported my vision uh, for being a full-time filmmaker and artist. So you were in Toronto? Mm-hmm. I was on, y'all. <gasps> Pack it up. We take Come it on trip. down <laughs> or up. Come on. Yeah, for me, it's um, a couple of my close friends from high school. I was on the step team in high school. Um, so uh, a, few, a few of the guys who are on my team uh, were still close. Um, they're not filmmakers themselves, but I can always, they're artists in different ways. So I always come to them um, when I have new, something new or just advice. Um, and then a lot of the artists I've met in the DC and Baltimore art scene um, especially uh, Chaotic Couture. Uh, they're, they're a rapper, um, DJ, host, artist. Um, so so me and Kyle, Chaotic Couture, um, we have uh, kind of like a similar outlook on things. So um, I always like to come to them um, when I have something new or I have an idea. Um, and just, just for advice or just to, to talk about our work, so. Nice. Okay, you guys were awesome. So I, I, I think we have some questions, is that correct? All right, so we have questions from the audience and um, this question is from Danielle Kapiden. What are some unexpected lessons that you guys learned in your filmmaking career? And again, double Dutch. What are some unexpected lessons that you've learned in your filmmaking career? I think for me, um, it was the importance of being vulnerable and really opening yourself up to your weaknesses and to your strengths. And um, I, I co-sign what you said, uh, Keisha, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, that you, you don't know until you go for it, you know? And the reward is just amazing because it's about growth, you know? And even if no one ever says to you, you did it, you know in your heart of hearts and your spirit and your soul that you did it. And it, it's, that's the, the most unexpected lesson, to know, to be open to the weaknesses and to my strengths. Mm. And it's, it helps me to keep going on this path. So that, that's my answer. All right, you guys. Um, I, I would say um, that a, a lot of times being rejected 
um, like not getting a grant actually helped me, made me double down even more and <coughs> say, you know what? Mm -hmm. um, even though you're not giving me the money that I asked for, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to keep on going. I believe in this project that I'm doing and I'm going to find a way to, to get it done. So um, if someone, you know, doesn't provide you with the funding that you're asking for, keep looking, keep working on your project if you really believe in it. And if you think that, you know, there's an audience out there for it too, just pursue it. Nice. So we're going to go to another audience question. Um, this one is for Gwen Alexis. What advice or help they would give to or do to help newcomers in the business? And if we can hear from some people that we haven't heard from, that would be awesome. So the question is advice and help that you would give to newcomers in the business. Um, for newcomers, at least as far as like the wrestling business goes, um, I would say that it would be really important to make sure that you're saving up. I think another, to even piggyback off the first question too, that another unexpected lesson was that a lot of this cost is going to be fronted by you. So, you know, I just wasn't expecting or preparing for a lot of that. So it's just important to make sure you consider that too. So along with not getting as much work in the beginning and along with having to, you know, pay people to make, to make my gear and pay people to make my head wraps and stuff like that and pay people to do my makeup or things like that. So it's just important to keep those things in mind. All right. Any, anybody else want to have advice for newcomers? Yeah, I, for, I'm sorry, Antonio, you go, you go right ahead. Yeah, I just want to say uh, very quickly, um, as far as filmmaking and production, things like that, um, definitely um, try to get experience. Um, filmmaking is, uh, is a team sport, uh, really. Um, so it's important to get, uh, if you can, get experience on different types of sets. So if you know, if you can search Facebook or even Craigslist or social media, you know, if someone's like filming something or if you know someone as a filmmaker, just um, extend a hand just to get experience on sets, working with people. Um, there's so many different types of roles that happen, whether it's like a big film or like a small film, something that I'm doing. Um, another thing is learn as much as you can. Um, we're at a point where you can literally make a film um, with and have everything fit in the book bag from your camera mm -hmm. to your computer to edit um, and everything. <clears throat> and literally like everything fits in my book, in a book bag I have. So you know, we're at a point where it's it's basically a must, you know, even if you don't want to be a director or cinematographer or an editor, you know, learning how to do all those things can, can only help, you know, it will never hurt to learn how to edit or to even do graphics or Photoshop um, or, you know, write a script or things like that. So even if that's not your passion or that's not your end goal, you know, it will always, it will always hurt, always help you know, never hurt to, to learn as much as you can about the process that goes into filmmaking. Nice. And I would say that, um, that you just go out and do it. I mean, even like Antonio said, I mean, there are people who are, um, as you all would know, they're making movies on their iPhones or their smartphones. And, and, and if it's in, in you to do it, the, the best way to, um, to experience even the process of learning is to go out and do. And I find that lots of times, especially talking to um, people who want to break into music or, or film, a lot of times they're waiting for these certain set of circumstances to kind of click into place. Mm -hmm. uh, those circumstances rarely come. Um, so if what you want to do is make a movie and right now all you have is your smartphone, then you go make a movie with your smartphone and then let the process, you know, let all that, you, that, that needs to come in that process come and you'll just do it. Just go out and do it and line upon line, you'll, you'll keep moving forward. Yeah, just do it. I like that Nike, that thing. Because if not, <laughs> if you don't, then you're going to be sitting and complaining and just do it. Don't be afraid either. Just go for it. Right. Okay, guys, we got about seven minutes left and we got another final audience question. And this is from Nola Honey. Creating and performing are vulnerable practices. 
how do you maintain safe spaces for your craft work? Mm. I, I that that's a very um critical part of of being an artist and being vulnerable in self-expression. You have to surround yourself with people who are going to support you through your process and support you emotionally and spiritually through the process. There's no way to bypass the vulnerability because it's through the vulnerability that you get authentic um, expressions and authentic work. But you have to make sure that you have the right people who are safeguarding your heart, your spirit, and your and your work. If you're not with the right people, then um, it can be it can be uh, very devastating and traumatic, especially when you're trying to create something of significance and impact. Nice. Anybody else want to answer? We got time. Yeah, sure. I can address that. Um, so for me, in my work generally, and for this piece in particular, um, I had to make sure, one, that I was sharing within my comfort level, and I encouraged my um, subjects or peers to also share within that level. Um, but I often went back to them with cuts and were like, hey, um, this is how I've cut this piece. How do you feel about it? Um, this is the other person's message that I'm cutting with yours. How do you feel about this? And so there were check-ins um, often um, as we do in healthily consensual processes, um, you know, that ideas can change, feelings can change, um, safety can change and leaving space and room for all of that, I think is really important in creating safer spaces uh, when we're creating work and as a filmmaker, uh, when I'm holding other people's stories as well as mine, um, I need to make sure that I'm holding them in the safest way possible and um, and sharing them with the world in the safest way possible. Exactly. Nice, That's good. That's good. good. That is yeah. good. Yeah. Anybody else? Um, if you have an opportunity where you live to join an organization of, um, for example, filmmakers, I would really recommend that. I live in the Washington DC area and we have a group called uh, Women in Film and Video and it's a really supportive group. Um, you can go to them for advice. Um, you can um, you know, share you know, maybe a, a clip or a trailer that you've done and get feedback, constructive feedback from them. So if there is such a group in your area, I really recommend it because we all learn from each other. It doesn't matter how many years you've been producing films, you're always learning something new, um, both from producing your own films and also from talking um, to other people and, and seeing how, how they're approaching you know, their films and their subjects. So I really recommend that. Nice. Anybody else? We still got a couple of more minutes for that. Yeah, I just want to uh, co-sign what Keisha, Keisha said about creating, as I don't see myself doing a narrative anytime soon, a documentary. When these three women said, yes, I'll be, I'll open my life up, my soul, my heart to the world. I wanted to make sure that that vulnerability was safeguarded in every way possible and create an atmosphere where they felt safe. And Carla, I hope I did that. They did, she did, absolutely. I, I mean, because they're, they're exposing themselves to the world, you know? So I think that is very, very important to make and surround yourself with people who understand that as well, so. Yeah, and not only exposing themselves, but they're exposing their dreams. Right. That's, that's vital. Um, I saw a show uh, and, and the man said, what's going to be around? The question was, what's going to be around um, 40 years from now? And, and he said, artists, which I thought was really amazing because, you know, artists, artists take the brunt of everything. Like, mm -hmm. like how dare you dream? How dare you uh, sit around and sing? You know, you, you can't eat doing that. And that, that man said, art would be happening 40 years from now. Right. 
Is that not, am I the only one who? No, art has been around since the beginning of time. As humans, we create. So why wouldn't we be around 40 years from now? And I, I know it's been said many, many times, but to quote Nina Simone, it's our duty to reflect the times. And that's what I try to do, you know, and, and want to continue doing. So I'm not surprised that we'll be around 40 years from now because we're gonna create the space for us to be around 40 years from now. The work that will make that happen and, and that will foment dialogue to hopefully a better world, you know. All right, nice. All right, you guys, it looks like we have to wrap things up. So where can people find your work? Where can people find you? Double Dutch. You can find me at B. Hayes Films on Instagram and on my website is brendaahayes.com. And thank you, Sheila, for uh, making us feel so comfortable including your jokes and everything else. Thank you for laughing. <laughs> See that, Nia? See that? They laugh. Uh, <laughs> Nia, 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 my kids. Go ahead. <laughs> you can find me on Instagram at Keisha, uh, or my website is KeishaWilliams.com. Uh, you can also follow my work or see uh, other pieces if you follow or subscribe to Patreon. Um, I have a Patreon uh, slash Keisha. I thought that was Patron. So that's Patreon? That's awesome. No, really, when I saw it, I got to be joking. Oh, no, no, I really did. We just want to keep it going. Okay, so no, 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 on Instagram, uh, my Instagram is Electric Llama. Um, you can also follow at Indelible Life. That's the uh, page for my documenting project, which this was a part of. And you can go to indelible.life to see all the episodes and see trailers and um, keep up with the project. Nice. Right. Well, you can follow our my um, band page, which is Wrath of Calm on Facebook. And also, I am CJ Poindexter9 on Instagram. Awesome. Cynthia. And my website is uh, for the film is kindredspiritsfilm.com. And on Facebook and also on Instagram, it's at kindredspiritsfilm. Nice. And you can find me here. <laughs> no, you can find me on Instagram at Silly Sheila and Facebook. Uh, Sheila Gaskins on Facebook, and I have an organization called Art Part Time where we talk mm -hmm. about racism in the art. So mm -hmm. make sure you join that. Uh, also know that Black Film Supremacy Film Festival will be available until Monday, September the seventh. Follow at BFS Film Festival on IG and Twitter, and also vote for the Audience Choice Award on BlackFilmFestival.com. Ooh. You guys, it's been wonderful. Thank you, Nia and Kia. Thank you, uh, Samai and everybody for letting me play and be myself. And you guys are great filmmakers and we look forward to some wonderful things happening for everyone. Happy endings all the way around. Thank you, Sheila. Well, thank, you, thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yes, thanks.